Well, I appreciate you tuning in to uh, this part two of our study in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, thankful that you're able to uh, take some time, put it aside, and and follow through uh, each video. Uh, we started a couple weeks ago teaching on the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, we got through chapter 1 and the first six verses. Uh, so let's just pick up. Uh, if you want to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1, we'll now start in verse 7, and we'll go through uh, verse 20. You know, believe it or not, I'll say it again as I started off last week, is that uh, John was given this revelation to encourage Christians that lived in the latter part of the first century. Uh, there was a, a whole lot of suffering and persecution happening in the Christian community at that time. So believe it or not, this book, as hard as it is at times to maybe understand, uh, was a great comfort and a great hope for them that lived in the latter part of the first century. So today, as we start in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 through 20, keep that in mind that these words are, for the most part, comforting and are there to give us hope for the future. Now, John, the Apostle John, writes this starting in verse 7, Revelation 1. He says, Behold, he... Jesus is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierce him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. And then the Lord God now speaks. He goes, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are found in Christ Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamon, to Thyteria and Sardis, and to Philadelphia and Laodicea. And then, John said, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, for I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I live forevermore, and I have the keys now of death and Hades. So write, therefore, the things that you have seen, John, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. We started off in verse 7 with a common theme that you'll find throughout the Bible, uh, and that is the coming of the great day of judgment. You know, the world does not like this message. The much, much of Christianity does not like this message. 
You know, how many messages have you heard just in 2023 last year on the wrath and fury of God on the great day who was and is and is to come? I dare say I I have not heard one. Not saying that someone out there isn't, but they're far and few between. But John, being a holy apostle sent by Christ to lay the foundation of Christ, he hears these words from God the Father. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail, W-A-I-L, on account of him. Even so, amen. Now, you, you know, let, let me suggest something. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a major scholar in the world of theology, but uh, let me suggest that the use of clouds, he's coming in the clouds, it, you know, that can be literally, and it could be metaphoric. The word clouds are used many times in the Old Testament, the prophets of old, and it referred to judgment. But the point is still the same. The risen Christ is coming. He's returning, and he is coming in judgment. And it's whether it's a literal clouds or not, it's going to be a universal judgment. And this is made clear that every tribe, every nation will be witness of this great day uh, from time until the end of time. And even those who had a hand in crucifying Jesus will see Christ return. And it says that many will wail, W-A-I-L, on account of Christ coming in never before seen power as the judge, Christ the judge. You know, in the Greek language, the word whale carries the meaning of people beating their chest or head, of mourning with a cutting sense of tragic loss. In other words, they're going to be cut to the heart when they see the return of Christ. And the Lord God tells us that he is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. In other words, he's the one true and living God. He's the very beginning of all creation, and he is the one that determines and knows all things, knows the end of all things. God and Christ are spoken of throughout Revelation as the Alpha and the Omega many times. God is eternal. God has no time limitations, or he's not controlled or constrained by space. So at this very moment, dear friends, God is, he was, and he is to come, the Almighty. The word Almighty holds the meaning of he who holds sway over all things. He rules all things. <laughs> John writes concerning his own personal condition at this time. You know, as a side note, uh, a well-known reference book titled Fox's Book of Martyrs, if you never read it, I challenge you to, uh, he states that as punishment for being a believer in Christ Jesus, the Apostle John was th thrown into a cauldron of boiling oil in Rome, and then he escaped by some miraculous way, obviously, without much injury, and the emperor Domitian afterwards banished John to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote down this book of Revelation. And then later on, Nerva, the successor of Domitian, uh, recalled John, and he was the only apostle of the original 12 who escaped a violent death. And as you can imagine, John is going through an incredible experience here as a probably a very old man uh, being banished to a prison island, Patmos. He suffered many things at the hand of people for his clear and faithful devotion to Jesus as the Messiah. You know, all the early traditions, and I, and I say traditions for a reason because it's uh, not made clear to us in the Word of God, but the early traditions agree that John left the Isle of Patmos where he was banished for preaching the gospel. John was the last living original disciple that spent his remaining days in Ephesus until he died somewhere around close the close of the first century, somewhere close to 100 years old, we are told. 
You know, we've got to understand something that in our modern society today, in the 21st century, when you stand on the whole counsel of God, the, the, the doctrine of God, the whole truth, the living word of God, and don't just pick out certain scriptures that tickles people's ears, then you're going to find that many people are going to turn away from you and consider you a Debbie Downer. You know, en encouragement does not have to come only with a golden tongue. You know, I can be encouraged, at least I can, by reading and hearing convicting words coming from hard truths that are spoken by, by Christ Jesus and God the Father. We tend to assume that encouragement comes from only the positive, pretty words. But if you, listen, if you, in your heart of hearts, really want to be changed into, and conformed to the image of your Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, then it's going to take more than just a rag to wipe away the dust and the dirt. It's going to take a hammer and a chisel at times to conform you. So the Apostle John tells us that as your brother, as your partner in the tribulation and in the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, that are part of following Jesus, uh, he was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of his of, of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then John states that on the first day of the week, which to us is Sunday, uh, he was in the Spirit. He, In other words, he was feeling the undeniable presence of the Spirit of God. He felt the influence of the Spirit. He heard a voice, and not just any voice, mind you, but a loud voice like a trumpet. It was the voice of Christ that he heard. And it was loud and clear, in other words. I mean, you, you blow a trumpet right behind you, it'll sometimes bust your eardrums. It's loud. But he was speaking with loud authority, telling John, Jesus was telling John to write this book and send it to the seven churches who existed at that time that Jesus had selected. You know... <laughs> You know, there wasn't 400 churches in one city like we have today. You know, uh, there was one church, the Church of Jesus Christ, located in each town, each place, each village. So there was no church hopping, no getting mad at one church and then going down to another. You either were part of that church in your community or you had to travel great distances to another church. And then John tells us he turned around to see this voice that was speaking to him, and it was Jesus. It was the glorified Christ. It was the risen Jesus. Maybe John, maybe he hadn't heard the voice of Jesus since the days that he walked with Jesus, but we sense here that it was definitely not the same meek and mild Jesus that John walked with on the earth some 50 to 60 years earlier. John describes the magnitude of now the, the presence of the Judge Jesus. I almost said Judge Judy. The magnitude of his presence in ways that, you know, would cause a man to tremble in reverence and uh, in a new and a fresh way. You know, it's written that the hairs of his head were white, as John described Jesus, the Judge like wool, like snow. His eyes were a flame of fire. His feet were burnished bronze. Uh, his voice was like the roar of many waters. You know, I've, I've heard people say with they, they visited the uh, big waterfalls, uh, you, you know, Niagara Falls or whatever, and you stand there and, and, and you just can't even hardly hear the person next to you. The roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars from his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. And, you know, these all have meaning behind them, friends. His hair was white because it represents complete and absolute wisdom, complete knowledge and understanding. His eyes were a flame of fire which can see and look into the heart of men and reveal their secrets. The seeing eye of Jesus can see a man's true motives. His highly polished bronze feet 
signifies he will crush his enemies and his voice of truth will be heard by everyone like a roar of many waters. His mouth speaks the word of God and it's like a sword. It's a double-edged sword. It cuts both ways. You swing to the right and then you turn right around and swing to the left without interruption, without no interruption, leaving no room for misunderstanding. It's bam, bam. That's his truth. It cuts, and it cuts swiftly. He no longer is just the light of the world, but he's the father of all lights as his face shines brighter than the sun. And then John loses all control over what he sees and over what he hears. And this was not the Jesus he walked with over for over three and a half years. Now John is almost faint as he takes in the majestic and the glory of the risen Christ. So all he can do is fall down, not just on his knees, but his whole body laid out at the feet of Jesus. And at this very moment, John knows that there's no more secrets, no more hiding behind the veil of our human frailty, no more no more uh, planning and plotting by selfish ambitions and hidden motives. They are destroyed, all of them, in a moment, in the presence of Jesus, the judge, the firstborn from the dead. But then Jesus laid his right hand on John, telling him, don't fear, don't dread, I'm in full control. I am the beginning, I am the end. Jesus is telling John, stand up, I've got much more to tell you. This speaks of the real divinity of Christ, God the Son of the Godhead, who holds the keys of death, who holds the keys of Hades, which is the place of departed spirits. And then John now has this massive responsibility to write down all that God gave him, that Jesus, you know, God gave to Jesus, Jesus gave his messenger, and the messenger gave John for the seven churches. And so then we turn over to the chapter two of Revelation, and we see Jesus begins that all with his all-seeing eyes, speaking now to the very first one of the seven churches, the church at Ephesus. Jesus, with eyes of fire, he can see the inward workings of all the churches as well as most people uh, in their outward working. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm thankful that, that he can look at the church at, at embassy, and he knows the leadership. He knows my life behind closed doors. He knows all the leaders' lives. He knows the people's lives inside and out. And uh, that may sound uh, scary at times, but it shouldn't be if we're really wanting to be love him, love the Lord, and follow him for all it's worth. Jesus, with eyes of fire, can see the inward workings of everyone and all the churches. You know, if you go and read the the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 8, I challenge you to do that. I'm not going to go into it today for time's sake. But you will see again how in the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 8, how God can see far beyond the outward walls and the cosmetics of the temple or the church. It will, it will scare you. It's, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the Almighty God, friends. In a vision, God opens up to Ezekiel's eyes to see what the elders are doing behind, the priests are doing behind the walls in the darkness, out of the sight of all the people. I challenge you to read Ezekiel 8 soon for yourself. You know, for the, for the most of the seven churches, we will read how Jesus will commend them for what is good and what is right, and then he'll, he'll usually have a rebuke for them for what is wrong. Both are meant for encouragement. Again, encouragement just is not sweet stuff, sweet talking. God disciplines those whom he loves. So we're going to look at Ephesus, the first city, and then we'll, we'll stop there today. So hang with me. In chapter 2, the first church that Jesus speaks of, speaks to is Ephesus. The city was famous uh, in its day for the Temple of Artemis, uh, which was completed around 550 B.C., and it's been designated one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Temple of Artemis is, was also known as the Temple Diana, which was a Roman goddess. And so here we read now Jesus speaking in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. He says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him, Jesus, who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works. 
I know them. you can't hide. I know your toil. I know your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but you've tested those who call themselves apostles, but they're not, and you found them to be false. How many people call themselves apostles? That's another talk show for another time. I know you are enduring patiently, Jesus said to the church at Ephesus, bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at the beginning, the love for God, the love for him. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, have a change of mind, and do the works you did at the beginning. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So as you can see, Jesus starts out his official order of proclamation to the church located in the city of Ephesus with an introduction of his royal authority. He's the one that holds the seven stars in his hands. He's the glorified risen Christ. He holds the office over all angels and authorities, both in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. He sends this message to Ephesus through his angelic messengers who then give it to the leaders of the church. And Jesus reminds us that it is he who walks among the lampstand. And the lampstand represents actually the church itself where Jesus is the head. Jesus is the head of the church. And this goes right along with the lampstands that were in the temple of the old covenant. This is where this, this language comes from. God gave orders in the Old Testament that the lampstand should be placed in the holy place of the temple. The lamp was to be tended by Aaron and his sons so that its light never went out. And so the lampstand was giving out light day and night. And in the new covenant, we individually now are temples of God. And together as believers, we are the temple of the Lord. The church, the assembly, are to be a city on a hill giving light day and night to a world of sin and injustice. And Jesus knows this as head of the church. If Jesus was the light of the world when he walked on planet Earth, then his ambassadors are to be no different. And then Jesus starts out by giving this stellar rating for his church leadership at Ephesus. He goes, you guys are doing pretty good. You're doctrinally good. You're enduring many hardships. You're recognizing false teachers and men who claim they are my apostles. But after careful examination of their daily life and their teaching, you found them to be false, both in word and conduct. So no doubt it was due to the teaching and preaching of Paul the Apostle, who spent a lot of time in Ephesus, as well as John the Apostle spent time in the church at Ephesus, teaching them uh, the truth, the doctrine of the living God. But many times, our determined efforts to maintain spiritual truth, now listen, many times in our effort to maintain spiritual truth and purity of doctrine, along with going through some very difficult times and hardships, uh, it can sometimes cause a hardness of heart within us. We end up looking, you know, for a demon under every rock and start sounding more like judges than we do humble servants. You know, humans, for the most part, we, we have our opinions and our thoughts, and we're always prone to be on the left ditch or the right ditch. But it really takes intentional pursuit to stay focused on Christ, follow him, rightly divide the word of truth, uh, that is both full of grace and truth. You know, Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. You got to have the balance of both. And Jesus demonstrated that great balance of walking down the center of a narrow path without falling in either ditch, the ditch of grace without truth, the ditch of truth without grace. Jesus truly rightly divided the word of God in deed and action. So as we read about the church at Ephesus, this church was a busy church, a separate church, a devoted and sacrificing church, but they suffered from hardening of the arteries. <laughs> you know, their heart became hard over time. They, and Jesus said, You're fall, you've fallen. They were in doubt, no doubt doing what is right in the sight of God, but it was kind of more of a duty out of the heart than, than out of a heart of great adoration and love for Christ. So Jesus chides them with the following words, I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at the beginning. Remember, therefore, where you've fallen, repent and do the works again. You know, in, in human relationships, it's, it's called 
sometimes it's called honeymoon love. You know, when a spouse begins to take for granted the other and then marriage becomes more routine and and that marriage can can maybe turn into a dangerous area. We've all experienced this in relationships. But as I like how one scholar puts it concerning the church at Ephesus. It's, he says the Ephesian church was so busy maintaining their separation from the world that they were neglecting adoration, adoration of Christ. In other words, labor is no substitute for love. Uh, purity is no substitute for passion. But he, And so, you know, there's this balance, dear friends. For a child of God shown clearly here in sacred scripture. It is, it is only as we love Christ fervently that we can really serve him faithfully uh, and rightly divide the truth. Um, you know, Paul wrote in Ephesus uh, that uh, we should love our Lord Jesus with love incorruptible. Love incorruptible. That's found in Ephesians 6:24. There again, in the letter to this church at Ephesus, you know, and I think of what Jesus said, love your God is the greatest commandment. Love him with all your heart, your mind, your strength, your soul, and the second like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. So you see, first love is incorruptible. It's indestructible. It lacks a capacity to decay or break down or misrepresent. First love is not a diminishing love, but a love that endures, and that is why That kind of love for God will bear much fruit of faithfulness through any and all circumstances. I want to close today with the remedy that Jesus gives now the church at Ephesus for their lack of adoration and love for him. First, Jesus tells them, remember. In the original Greek language, it literally means keep on remembering. Don't stop remembering what we have lost humble ourselves before God, and start restoring and cultivating this love relationship that we had at the beginning with him. You know, I think it's like taking care of a garden. We have to care and cultivate that garden. Left the weeds of life, we'll choke it out, and there's not going to be any fruit. Second, Jesus said, you've got to repent. In other words, have a change of mind. Confess your lack of love. See how far you have fallen. And then thirdly, Jesus said, you must repent of and do the first works. In other words, to restore our original fellowship of love with God the Father and the Lord Jesus, this means stop neglecting prayer, Bible reading, meditation on the Word of God, obedient, humble service outside the walls of the church and and to one another, and daily worship. You know, the bottom line is this. Jesus is revealing to us and the church at Ephesus, that a church that is losing its love for God, that has fallen from its first love, is in danger of losing its light, its lampstand. That's what the lampstand is. The the church that loses its first love for God in Christ will soon lose its light to the world. So Jesus told the church, listen, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand unless you repent. We're going to stop here, stop here today uh, due to a lack of time, and we'll, we'll start again uh, in part three of the revelation of Jesus Christ. But uh, finally, let me just ask this, ask this question. Did, did, if, did the church at Ephesus listen to the words of Christ? I don't know. You know, the fact is this. We, we find Ephesus today is a, just a heap of stone. There's no more light shining from that church. So maybe they didn't. Anyway, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, I appreciate you tuning in, listening to this wonderful study. And uh, until next time, may God richly bless you.